Okay. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Hi, Steve. <laughs> I'm glad you found you found us. Um, so I am Julie Roth. Welcome to GLREA's Ann Arbor Solar Stories. Uh, we are, um, I am the Senior Energy Analyst at the Office of Sustainability and Innovations at the City of Ann Arbor. And the GLREA hosts these solar stories um, and I come in to help with the Ann Arbor ones. I have a, just a couple of slides to introduce everybody, maybe, if I can find them. Mm -hmm. There we go. So this is where you are. Uh, our speaker today is Steve Sherman. I'll tell you more about him in a minute. Um, the financial sponsors of this program are the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, which is Eagle, Homeland Solar, McNaughton McKay Electric Company, Iron Ridge Racking and Harvest Solar. So we thank all of them for their financial sponsors. Um, if you're new here and you don't know, or if you're old here and you don't know, um, the GLREA puts on um, energy Zooms every Thursday. So the first Thursday of every month is this. It's a story from somebody in Ann Arbor about their solar. Uh, the second Thursday of each month is a clean energy seminar. Um, I'm looking forward to this 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 month's clean energy seminar. It should be pretty interesting. The third Thursday is Detroit Solar Stories. And then the fourth is either um, a Michigan solar story from somewhere else around Michigan or an energy Q&A where you can come and ask all of your energy related questions to all of the sort of nerdy energy people who hang out on Thursday night Zooms, myself included often. So uh, no disparagement meant. <laughs> um, very, very great, uh, great resource for people. So in case you don't know, the GLREA is a 501c3 nonprofit. It was formed in 1991 and it's supported by members to educate and advocate for renewable energy in the Great Lakes region. And they do both of these in spades, educate and they advocate uh, in Lansing particularly. Um, ways you can help the GLREA, you can renew your membership if you have one or become a member if you don't. You can financially sponsor a membership for a local teacher or student if you'd like. Um, you can tell other people about the GLREA, encourage them to come to these meetings. Um, and of course, you can just make a financial donation. And if you'd like to do that, you can email John Freeman and he would be more than happy to take your financial uh, contribution, no doubt. Um, but enough about that. And I'm going to introduce our speaker today, who is Steve Sherman, but you can call him Solar Steve because that's how he identifies himself, Solar Steve. He's an energy systems engineer and an entrepreneur, and he's passionate about enabling everyone to own their own energy. He's a three-time U of M alum that stuck around the Ann Arbor area. He now lives on an eight-acre hobby farm just north of town uh, with pens, um, 15 of them, apparently. Uh, he recently built a barn and designed and installed his own 7.8 kilowatt grid optional solar system that he's excited to share with all of us tonight. He's also the co-founder of Superior Energy, which is a solar energy design and engineering company. And he's employed at One, which is our next energy, which is a next generation energy storage company. So this is not like just your average Joe. He knows things that are more than I know. And so um, I imagine that you'll be able to get lots of your technical questions answered here if that is uh, what you wish. So Steve, thank you for being here and I will hand it over to you. Yes, thanks so much for having me. Uh, super excited. Um, I will admit before I flash up my screen, uh, lots of exciting things going at one, our next energy, my daytime employer. Um, I also took very fittingly delivery of uh, two Arc Lithium uh, five kilowatt hour each batteries today, which at a residential address was admittedly a kind of fun experience now that it's done. So uh, I went super uh, uh, lean and clean with my PowerPoint, but I think it's jam packed with lots of info and more importantly, uh, excited for the discussion. But let me uh, share screen here and we'll get to uh, presenting. 
And uh, Julie, uh, you are awesome. And I love the work you're doing in uh, City of Ann Arbor. I'm technically a little outside city limits, but that's okay. We can still be best friends. Um, uh, but I am still in Washtenaw County. So uh, anyway, Solar Steve, you heard it. So I'm going to actually intro wrap uh, myself. Uh, my name is Solar Steve. I'll tell you what I want to achieve. Become Superman of the sun. I'm trying to make solar and storage affordable, desirable, and achievable for everyone. So if you remember one thing, you know, rap's a good way to uh, remember who I am. Uh, but maybe more important than the rap is what I'm all about, my why. Uh, so my personal mission is to jolt the world's transition to a sustainable energy present. And some of you might recognize that, uh, similar to Tesla's mission, accelerate the world's transition to a sustainable energy future. But uh, they've done great work, very uh, much inspired by that company. And um, the technology, we're at the point where we need this now, not in the future, so present. And Jolt is the derivative of acceleration for my physics and engineer fans out there. Uh, so we're accelerating the acceleration, essentially. And then my big, healthy, audacious goal, I want to directly contribute to a terawatt of solar photovoltaic uh, installed, man managed, or otherwise brought into fruition because of uh, me and my team and my endeavors. And then you can see for context, world's about 20 terawatts, but we got plenty of it from the good old sun. Uh, quick background, I won't go through all this. Julie hit the high points. Uh, which is probably the 15 hens. I'm going to call it Washtenaw County's uh, best eggs, uh, including blue and green ones, white to dark brown, everything in between. Uh, very lucky to, to be next to a garden legend neighbor who did landscaping and is now retired. So uh, eggs go one way over the fence, vegetables come the other. Uh, pretty soon we're probably going to try and nano grid and uh, put electricity over the fence too or under it. Uh, career automobile magazine, uh, any Ann Arborites probably remember when they were in the original Liberty Bell uh, building. Uh, Bad Knock Engineering here on River Ventures, another uh, Ann Arbor venture capital fund, small one. Hyundai America Tech Center, just east of town, Novation Analytics, that was a uh, uh, boutique consulting firm and vehicle efficiency. I uh, just left Ford a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was on Team Edison, which is electric vehicles, and then Ford X, which is the, um, uh, at least on paper, the disruptive innovation part of the company. But uh, very excited to be at One, our next energy, very appropriate. Hopefully you can tell. Um, this is the company that put a battery in a unmodified uh, Tesla Model S, drove up to the Mackinac Bridge, turned around, came back, did a couple of laps around the block, 752 miles in an electric vehicle that other than the battery and controls was unmodified. So bye-bye uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, and speaking of paradigm shifts, uh, you know, 100 plus years, electric utilities have had a natural and state granted monopoly, no competition. Admittedly, it made sense. But now we've got all these distributed energy resources, solar, inverters, storage, demand flexibility that are becoming not boutique, uh, oh, let me call Outback Power and engineer my own system because I feel like doing this in my spare time, but actual products that you can buy and in integrated systems at affordable prices that are financeable. And I mentioned this because I really like GLREA's um, kind of mission statement, if you will, uh, where they talk about empowering members and the public, uh, not only through advocacy, which is really important, but also education, i.e. these systems are real and they're better and they're cheaper. Uh, and then strategic collaboration, events like this, where I can share my grid optional solar system that uh, you know promotes free market expansion of renewable energy. So great to be here. So I'll get to my system in a sec, I promise, got some cool photos, but I, I just wanted to take a step back and think about what have customers always valued in their electricity service? It's three things, affordable, I can afford my bills and my kilowatt hours are cheap and reasonable, it's reliable, lights stay on, I can use it when I want to, 
And historically, it's it's been safe that I'm going to now shift that to clean, given climate crisis, energy crisis, geopolitics, uh, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not trying to be too mean here, but if we look at our competition of how the customers are currently being served, I think everyone knows these two headlines from this week. Uh, I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, and then fuel mix, you're probably all familiar with this. Lots of coal, a little bit of nuclear, uh, natural gas, small amount of solar. I know that's ramping up, but um, I'm a bit more ambitious about distributed uh, electricity systems versus uh, centralized and, and legacy ones. 2.2 um, million customers, lots of megawatt hours. I will point out by definition and in law, investor owned companies, their uh, shareholders are their number one priority. Um, bit unfortunate, I won't go into that. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, DT and other investor owned utilities refer to us as rate payers, uh, not customers admittedly. And then you see their kilowatt hour prices on the right. Um, this is a breakdown of my utility bills before solar. Um, uh, it definitely took an energy systems engineering degree from Michigan to interpret their black and white confusing bills. Uh, hopefully, I, I'm assuming many of you agree. Uh, the one I'll point out is how big that distribution piece of the pie is. So that's to get electricity over their wires to my house. And it's a very sizable chunk. One of the big reasons I'm so um, uh, bullish on distributed systems, because if I produce solar on my roof, put it in my, to my inverter and consume it in my house, there's you know, no wires, no distribution. Um, it's let's call it zero cents per kilowatt hour distribution charge at that point. Uh, this was all pre-solar. My latest DTE bill, um, admittedly, this was before batteries and before I had all of my panels uh, hooked up. Um, doesn't really matter. I was just waiting on a nicer junction box. It was $43. My goal with a $32 uh, generation bank credit. Uh, so let's call it a net of $10. I think that's pretty good. I want to get it zero uh, minus maybe the $7.50 charge, which by the way, if you're over 65, you can call in and uh, reduce that to half per month. Little fun fact. So I, uh, as Julie mentioned, I'm an engineer, but I'm also an entrepreneur. So I love consumer choice. Competition is a good thing. It makes things better for everyone, especially the customer. Um, so when we look at solar designs, I would put out there that historically there have been kind of three big categories in uh, sorry, I'm trying to move a box. Hopefully you can see, um, you know, there's grid tied, very standard, proven, simple, quote unquote, spin your meter backwards. Only problem with that is you're still one, you lose power with a grid outage for safety reasons. And you're de very dependent on the net metering policy and agreement, which uh, I'm sure everyone on this call knows uh, DT pays about seven and a half cents for every kilowatt hour you export. Uh, and they will gladly, you know, turn around and sell you it for about 18 cents um, uh, later. Uh, grid tie with battery backup, you know, kind of always the appeared to be holy grail, but the technical integration of this is quite complicated, especially with AC coupled batteries, multiple inverters, um, things like that. I'm, I haven't done a system like that, mainly because they're so technically complicated, but they do exist. And then finally, off-grid, which, you know, you're independent and sometimes it's your only option, but you're sizing that system for the worst case scenario of the year. So, you know, lowest sun, highest load, it's a lot of solar, a lot of batteries. Those are both expensive, um, though they are, you know, coming down a lot in price, as many people know, I'm sure. Um, and you still are usually supplementing that with a combustion generator or doing aggressive load management. Um, and then I would uh, propose that now with new technologies, um, like especially hybrid inverters, which I'll talk about, there's kind of a new paradigm of grid optional where you're still connected to the grid. Um, you can sell electricity to it if, if you so choose, uh, but you're prioritizing your solar and storage as your main energy source and keeping things behind the meter as much as you can. 
Um, that's, you know, you're immune from grid outages, you're immune from unfavorable net metering policies. Uh, I can start with a battery, I can start with solar um, and add a battery later. There's a lot of flexibility in the system. Uh, so finally, here's the picture of uh, Sherman Farms. Uh, that's the new barn. Uh, very fortunate to have been able to be the general contractor on that with my dad. Uh, it was kind of a dream project for us. He's a big car guy um, and always wanted kind of a father-son barn. So just my little side note on that. Um, the windmill is aesthetic for now. It does work. Uh, it was originally intended to pump water. Rather than uh, retrofit that beauty, I think I'm going to leave it for aesthetics and add probably a one to two kilowatt uh, modern wind turbine later to supplement my system. Um, and I have underground utility service. It uh, goes to the barn, which then uh, subfeeds my home. Uh, and then on the right is uh, kind of the insides, if you will. So right on the other side of that meter, uh, there's the Solark uh, hybrid inverter. I'll talk about that on a different slide. On the left is my main load panel or circuit breaker panel. Um, that's grid tied and powers all the barn. And then on the right is a sub panel that feeds my house. And that is the... Uh, it, the label says battery essential loads panel, also critical loads panel, but the solar converter is sized large enough that um, that's a uh, full house backup. And I admittedly um, uh, am single, live by myself, so it is lower loads, but um, they do make a larger inverter that is uh, 200 amp uh, output, which is typical service and 240 volts, typical service for a residential. So true replacement to, uh, you know, utility service, essentially. Uh, here's, I didn't have time to pull down my technical uh, one line electrical diagram. This probably communicates more anyway. Um, it's basically what I just described. I'll uncover the green box in a little bit. Um, so yeah, uh, not too much here. Uh, solar, I'll just fire off through some of the specs. Uh, Helene 390 watts module, so nice and energy dense. Uh, side note, I'm very excited for the bifacial modules coming out. Uh, 450 watts, even approaching 500 watt modules, which those are big boys, but if you have a big roof, uh, why not uh, pack a lot of power on it? So I've got 20 of them, three strings. Uh, my inverters program to export limit at 6.24 thanks to DT and their interconnection calculations. I'll get to that. 40 by 80 nominal, Canadian made, black on black, metal roof mounted on the barn, iron ridge racking. Uh, you saw the photo. Uh, I know I'm a giant energy nerd and all I think about is this stuff, but I think they look cool. I think they look good. Um, most people neutral to positive. Some people don't like the look. Um, I guess they can buy from DT and their wires. Uh, inverter, lots I could talk about this. I, I would just say the general public service announcement of look up this company, look up their tech, uh, watch a webinar. This is game changer stuff. Uh, it has a DC side for solar and batteries, an AC side for all the loads and grid tie. Um, the middle breaker, the gen, or I would call it a flex breaker can do three things, interconnect with the generator for um, uh, peak shaving, essentially, uh, AC couple to existing solar, uh, or it can be a smart load, which is great for things like domestic hot water heater, essentially a one-way thermal battery, uh, EV charging. And um, basically what that does is take any marginal excess solar and rather than sell it to the grid at seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour, it'll put it to that load. So an EV is you know, 25 cents plus uh, per kilowatt hour in value. Um, so would I rather you know, self-consume at 25 cents or sell it for seven and a half? I would rather self-consume at that point. And this inverter handles that. Um, many different modes. I'll leave the webinar up to that. Um, I talked about solar soak loads. Um, there's a grid zero mode, which will match your solar and storage, keeping everything behind the meter and to the utility, it just looks like your consumption went down to maybe zero if you have enough solar and storage. 
and a, uh, it uses um, uh, CTs, current transformers, to measure that. And according to Solark, there's no net metering agreement to it. Um, I, they have some controls where even when your house doesn't have a load, the inverter will pull a load to basically guarantee you're never exporting. And then I would probably say most importantly is probably that last one. That is one box on my wall packaged to integrate and control solar, battery, grid tie, critical loads, and manage um, what is otherwise a very complicated system. And uh, I've had it for a couple of months now and huge fan if you can't tell from me talking about it. Uh, and then, like I said, two batteries arrived today, it's supposed to be next week, uh, commercial shipping, not quite as good as Amazon Prime, I guess. Uh, I'm not a customer, but I've heard. Um, so luckily, I had two other friends help me unload these. Wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, and there they are, landed in the barn, not plugged in yet. I'm going out of town this weekend, so that'll be my, you know, excited to return home. Um, I think I'll just cut, highlight a couple. I have two of them, so it's 10.24 kilowatt hours. Uh, not a huge bank, but certainly enough for um, you know con a conservative load profile. If I know the grid's down, um, it uh, will probably run my AC for a little bit, but um, you know I'd, I'd probably conserve a bit. Um, there's definitely plenty of power. I'm, I'm just talking energy capacity, so. Uh, 10.24 kilowatt hours. You can read my cycle math there. Translates to about nine cents a kilowatt hour. I'll give the breakdown for my solar later. Lithium iron phosphate, very safe. Uh, 80 amp out recommended output per battery. So these are in parallel. Uh, zero maintenance, built-in battery management system. Um, and uh, the last one, Amish off-grid tested. So when I was specking out batteries, I was impressed by this company talking about their uh, development process. They actually started off-grid uh, with Amish community in Ohio and Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, you can imagine, I don't know the Amish super well, but, um, you know, they have semi-modern equipment. Uh, last time I was in Ohio and it, they're smaller houses and loads, but they're off-grid. So, uh there you go. Um, all right, uh, most are probably familiar with this. I'll just give a, a kind of a strategy or maybe tip. Um, DT now offers a time of use rate plan. Um, I didn't have time to pull down all the kilowatt hours and I don't have a, the pricing and I don't have them memorized, but basically 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. AKA when the sun's shining, you're on on peak, off peak outside of that. Um, and it just pairs well with really solar because you get a higher credit for those on-peak exports. I believe it's around 16 cents a kilowatt hour versus seven. And you get a lower price for off-peak imports. So if I do have to um, you know, import electricity overnight, I don't have batteries yet, I can buy it for cheaper. Um, and you, know, you certainly need some attention to load management, i.e. You know, don't plug in an EV at 10 kilowatts when your solar is only producing two or three kilowatts extra, because then you'll just import on peak, but we can do it. Controls are coming. I trust the software folks will figure it out and, and one of the software folks working on that. Uh, and then, you know, this opens it up for Southwest and West facing arrays to kind of match that, you know, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. window. Uh, I'll kind of skip the interconnection experience. I think I poked enough at DT, but I didn't, uh, I sensed their bias throughout every step of it. And I don't think it was very fair if I'm being honest. Uh, and honestly, the most, the biggest question I've gotten during this install was, what right does DT have to tell you how much you know solar you can put on your roof? Um, that honestly was one of the biggest questions. So with that, here's my pricing breakdown. Um, you know, self-installed certainly enabled a lot of this, but um, I actually I told Julie um, I would love to see kind of a some support of DIY solar. Um, I know we're not quite there to make this a mass market thing. But uh, honestly, I think it's a lot more achievable than most people think, um, especially with DIY movements and um, just how the world is. Uh, so about $1.78 per watt uh, after the federal tax credit, I believe that is, translates to about seven cents a kilowatt hour. 
Uh, you can see my battery breakdown, about nine cents a kilowatt hour for storage. So seven plus nine, about 16, obviously not an exact number, but approximately see how that compares to DT. More importantly, I own my energy, not rent it, much more resilient and immune close to immune to grid power outages, you know, maybe a two week storm in the middle of winter with no solar, I'd be in trouble, but I can conserve. Last but not least, summer project coming soon. I had a great intern this year. Um, we're putting solar on wheels. I'll leave it at that. Um, and then my intention with this is have off-grid capable, portable, uh, but also be able to AC couple when it's parked at my house to uh, to that solar arc, uh, just to have a bigger system, you know, some on the roof, some on the ground. So uh, we're at seven, hey, 728, not bad. Uh, I thought I heard it was half hour, half hour. And with that, uh, call Solar Steve for your home energy needs. Um, let's, uh, let's talk more solar and systems and uh, crazy stuff I talked about. Thanks for the time. Wow, Steve, that's amazing. So I'm gonna start, but I want I have clarification questions. So your inverter, you're still grid tied in that you are you're still an interconnection um, agreement where you're bi-directional, right? You didn't do an a unidirectional interconnection, correct? Correct. Uh, I would love to hear about unidirectional. Uh, I didn't know that was a thing, but yes, I have a fully executed net metering agreement with DT. Um, it is limited at 6.24 kilowatts and I have 7.8 on my roof. Um, that's just an easy program in my inverter and it literally will never export more than 6.24. So um, it, it's still fully in you know, uh, compliance with the agreement. That's interesting. I don't know anyone who has one, but my understanding is the city of Ann Arbor is exploring a sustainable energy utility, which would be have to be unidirectional interconnection because there's no way that we could feed back into the grid. Um, uh, I believe that exists. And so I, that is originally what I thought you were going to say is that you had you pulled from the grid, but you didn't feed back into it. And that was uh, that was a high rate nature of it. But what you're saying is that your excess generation is largely used on site because you are using your EV or your hot water heater as sort of storage, correct? And your and your inverter system is smart enough to to put it there before it exports it. Am, am I getting that right? 100 layman's terms okay yeah, in more than layman's terms you got it exactly right um i should have put um a chart i made this summer but you guys will get the full blog post instead so in the chat here is a little blog post i wrote talking about self-consumption which uh dt will never talk about this um at least in my experience but uh, essentially, yes, consuming it on site and keeping it behind the meter um, can accelerate the economics and payback. So um, I'll let you read that blog. There's a nice chart in there. Um, if anyone catches anything I missed or mis mistake, please send it my way. But um, as far as I know, that's that's pretty rock solid numbers. I could ask a million questions, but I'm going to stop because there's all these other people here. <laughs> We'll have you out in person, like we've been talking about. I think John's got his hand up. You can't really see it because it's against the bookshelf there. Uh -huh. oh, sorry about that. I, I should have chosen a different hand color, shouldn't I? Um, the uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that you were able to arrange a contract with DTE that uh, uh, where, where you promise not to uh, uh, deliver more energy to them than your what they consider to be your annual consumption. Uh, I'd like to hear more about how your system actually accomplishes that. And I'm also wondering uh, how you accomplished that with DTE. Did they have to approve your uh, SolArc uh, program 
And what if you now change the program to dump as much as possible onto the grid? Um, do they care? Do they know? Yeah. Um, so I think first question around was around like how do how does the inverter basically do that? Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Um, you know, does does it just uh, 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 deliver? Uh, uh, all the energy in the first half of the year and then shut you off for the rest? No, um, let me pull up my screen. So, all right. Um, so right at this uh, utility SE for service entrance, 200 amp. So that black line that I have highlighted, um, there are two CTs, which are current transformers. They're just clamps that go around the wire, and then they communicate back to the soul arc to essentially read right at my, you know, interconnection between my solar and storage system and the grid, what's going on on that wire. Am I importing? Am I exporting? Um, so it has a measurement right there, and then that feeds into its kind of controls and algorithm, which... Um, you know, Solark would have to tell you details of that. Um, and then, I mean, other than that, it's basically just programming. Uh, I forget what it's called in it, but export limit, let's call it for lack of a better word, and just saying 6.24. And then in my case, which is what was approved by DTE, um, and uh, it will just never export more than 6.24. Um, this can curtail solar in a worst case scenario if you know batteries fully charged, that flexible load wasn't there or I'm not using it or something and the rest of the load didn't meet it. Um, so it's, I mean, the, the paradigm I would say is just like, these are two parallel energy systems and mine is just prioritized for solar and storage behind the meter that is directly connected to the loads. Um, and, and the grid's just kind of there as a, a secondary backup at nights, winter. Um, you know, this is all installed this summer. And obviously, I would love to come back on maybe next spring, uh, have a little more time for my presentation and give kind of the full report out. But um, anecdotally, just monitoring it every day, I've been thrilled with it. Um, overall. Um, I think second point was around kind of the interconnection agreement and how would they notice? Um, so I'll answer the second part. How would they notice? Um, again, I, I don't work at DT, so I don't know all the inner workings, but my guess would be their smart meter would eventually see, hey, 7.8 kilowatts is being exported, but there's an agreement in place that this is only 6.2, so something's going on. But again, I have my solar arc limited for 6.2, so that's never going to happen unless I change it. Um, I mean, maybe I will someday to see what happens. My guess is they've got enough other things to worry about than a roughly kilowatt and a half discrepancy, but Theoretically, I guess they could, you know, that way. Um, and then uh, as far as the application went, um, I mean, it was pain in the butt. They didn't even have four months of my billing history. Of course, I called in and got it. Um, they were making a bunch of dumb assumptions, in my opinion. They use a capacity factor, which is in the power domain, despite the Michigan Public Service Commission being written in an energy-based domain. Uh, I pushed back on that and they were like, well, MPSC gave us this equation, talked to Julie Baldwin. They didn't give her that, them that equation. So, you know, fun shenanigans of uh, seeing the impending competition and deciding they can squash it. But as a, hopefully you took from my presentation, I don't buy it. Technology enables different things. Just get, get out of that mindset. So I'm rambling a bit. Hopefully that answered your question. Well, I, not not really. Um, the um, the limit that, as I understand it, is the limit in the amount of energy that you can produce, not the amount of power. And so that's what it should be. But they do a power capacity factor where they basically go, you consume ten thousand kilowatt hours over the last year. We're going to multiply it by twenty four hours a day times three hundred sixty five days a year. 
then multiply it by 0.13, and then that gets you a kilowatt you're allowed to install, install on your roof. If you read the Michigan Public Service Commission, you're right. It says you cannot be a net kilowatt hour exporter, which would mean if I consume 10,000 in a year, I'm only allowed to sell DT 9,999 or I guess 10,000. Okay, I, I understand. They're kind of uh, 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 cheating a little bit. The, um, so, so then what, how did you persuade DTE that you were not gonna produce too much power at any time? Did they come and look at your solar programming and agree no. that that's the way it was set up or did they just take your word for it? Yeah, they took my word for it. I mean, I signed a net metering agreement that said, I'm not gonna export more than 6.24 kilowatts. That's why I programmed my Solark for. Solark's a, um, you know, UL listed, all the listings and everything. So it's an approved inverter. And um, like I said, they, yeah, theoretically I could change it and uh, export more than 6.2 and they could notice and come after me, but I could say the same thing about someone installing more solar on their roof. I mean, you know, so okay. yeah, if they really wanted to, they could. And if I really wanted to, I could, but uh, the energy is more value to me behind the meter. They only pay me 17, seven and a half cents if I'm on a standard rate plan. And then it's a little better if I'm on time of use, but um, you know, I, I prioritize everything behind the meter. Okay, great. Thanks. I think I understand now. Do you want me to call on people or you want to go ahead, Steve? Uh, Jens. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thanks. Uh, I wanted two points. One, I just did the paperwork with DTE and I was actually pleasantly surprised with the website and the support. They called me back and followed up and that got sorted in like a few days. So maybe it's different teams or something. <laughs> Uh, I haven't gone live for anything yet, but uh, the first three, four steps were, were pretty nice. Um, second is DIY kind of supply chain and sourcing. I, I, I built and designed everything, but it's like a royal challenge to get parts. Once you get a quote a week later, they out of stock of the panels and you reject the whole array. Then you get the different quote. It's like, where do you get the stuff from in, in Michigan? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I'll save the interconnection one. So I'll answer sourcing and supply chain and stuff. Um, uh, I guess one, I gotta give a shout out to my, the company that I work for during the day. One, um, one of our goals is a Western hemisphere supply chain for our battery cells. So, and no nickel or cobalt. Um, so LFP batteries primarily from the US and then some lithium from um, um, Brazil. That's a much bigger thing I get, but that's my shout out for the company. Um, anyway, uh, I sourced from a company called Unbound Solar and their whole model is they basically enable DIYers like me. Um, they do design and engineering. They'll give you, um, you know, a, I have a 26 page plan set that has the electrical diagram, the mechanical, all the specs, everything. Um, very good to work with, especially the first time around. So I would absolutely recommend them. Uh, again, that's Unbound Solar. Um, and then now for like business is, uh, and I'm starting to do some other customers and things. Um, you know, there's the good old Alt E store uh, in Massachusetts, um, very kind of old school, like DIY off grid, lots of outback type stuff. Um, but they have very good pricing and selection. Uh, it's definitely much more for the kind of technical minded. I would never send like my mom and dad there. Um, but uh, there's also Zona Energy in, I think, Ohio, maybe Pennsylvania. Um, and I've been talking to them about to order a pallet of um, solar panels, modules, and um, um, some inverters. Um, okay, so far, but their pricing is very good. Um, so yeah, Unbound Solar for DIY, uh, Alt E Store if uh, for very DIY, and then Zona Energy for good pricing and more local. Um, and then on the interconnection. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hit the interconnection real quick. Um, you know, yeah, you're not wrong. They were nice and not, it wasn't the worst experience I went through. I'm more so saying like, I could see some tech, maybe almost technical flaws. Like I said, you know, capacity factor, which is in power domain versus MPSC writes it in the energy domain. So that's a bit of hand waving. Um, the fact that they have really any governance on the, like as much influence as they do on the system, I strongly disagree with that just out of personal values. Uh, the application should be um, how, what's the peak kilowatt you're exporting to the grid and maybe a couple other system parameters like energy expectations, but them needing spec sheets on panels and all that stuff is kind of BS in my opinion. Um, the thing I will say yeah, is yeah. they lost, they lost, so you have to mail in a check, which it's 2022. I mean, a little <laughs> silly, come on. Uh, they said it would be a million dollars in IT upgrades to enable online payment. So yeah, have fun with that. Uh, they lost my first check and counted it as a billing credit. So that's fun to mail, not one check, but a second one. Uh, I talked about how they didn't have four months of my billing history, which I got in one phone call, stuff like that. And uh, it, it just boils down to like, they should not have nearly as much influence on a system as they do. I mean, they're an investor owned utility that is for profit and I'll kind of leave it at that. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. They, they did indeed ask a lot of details that doesn't really matter. So, uh, I see Dale Klein. Hi, Steve. Uh, what did you do for the rapid shutdown? Do you, are there uh, devices on each panel or there's one per string or how does that work? Yeah, um, I'm out in the country, admittedly, in the local AH, AHJ authority having jurisdiction, definitely on the um, uh, kind of more lenient side of things, I'll say. Um, I have it per string, the solar candle, some of that. Um, admittedly, I haven't spent a ton of time looking into that. Um, it was kind of a check the box for me, but yeah, there's, there's one on each string. Um, I don't know, you know, if it's the latest and greatest NEC 2022, where every single panel has to have one. Um, you know, there have been solar systems pre-rapid shutdown and things like that. So I I think it's a safe system. This is a barn, not my residence. Um, there's an entire other side of the roof that's untouched. If for some reason a firefighter had to go up on the roof, even though it's a barn with four good walls and a 10 foot door. Um, but yeah, good question. And then uh, can I ask too, you, you mentioned the, uh, D 1.2 time of use rate. Are you on that already? Or are you plan to be? Yeah, um, I, I am. That does work really good. Okay. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, let's see, where do I start on this? I actually got on it because of the EV charger rebate. So another little tip for you, rather than, you know, send DT $5, you can get them to send you $500. Uh, they have an, yeah, EVSE, which is electric vehicle service equipment, AKA level two EV charger. Um, uh, they that's have a, separate, that's yeah, a separate meter though, or nope. uh, D so they have an EV rate plan, which is on a separate meter. It's a bit older, uh, time of use is your whole house. And, um, so to, to get that $500 rebate, you have to switch to a time of use plan. Um, so that was kind of my original motivator. And then just being a super energy nerd and, you know, understanding loads and shifting and things like that. I was like, yeah, I'll play this game all day uh, and, you know, wait to do laundry till 7.01 PM. Um, and then I think I did this for you, Julie. I've actually got a nice uh, Excel tool where if you send me um, not your DT bill, but there's actually a link you can get from DT. They'll give, I think it's 15 minute or hourly increments of consumption. I can plug that into my Excel and whether you have solar or not tell you is time of use, uh, the right plan for you. Um, but yeah, it definitely makes sense with solar. Um, you saw my reasons you're exporting on peak sun doesn't shine at night kind of by definition. Um, and then, um, you know, that solar, I'm really, the batteries came today, as you saw and heard, um, I'm really looking forward to programming in those time of use rates and kind of seeing how it, you know, 
shifts things in and out of it. Um, kind of at the cutting edge and, you know, it probably won't be as seamless as it should be, but um, we'll figure it out. Maybe Sandy or Julie, if you're gonna, if you wanna. I think her. Sandy was next. Um, I, I don't know if this is the place to bring it up, but you did have it on your first slide about the proposed DTE rate change. I mean, that is going to be a huge hit for those of us who've already bought solar and installed it, isn't it? And what is uh -oh. Ann Arbor Sustainability doing about it? Anything at all? I wrote to two of our uh, representatives and got a really nice email back from Jeff Irwin, who's really on our side, but What's what? What more can you talk, tell us? Uh, maybe this is a question yeah. for Julie more than Steve, and maybe I should put it in a different venue. Mm -hmm. but, and, yeah, Pro, um, Julie can better answer. I'm going to jump in with a just my quick take on it. Um, my understanding is that the headlines I was pulling that doesn't have anything to do with solar. There may be parts of it that do, but that was just more a general uh, rate plan increase. So, you know, in the solar world, that would be on, on the imports, you know, buying electricity from the grid. Um, they did switch from a one-to-one -one net metering policy, which I had at my old house, good old, just spin that meter backwards. And it's a one-to-one -one bill credit or close to it. Um, but in May, 2019, they changed to the distributed generation program, which another word for that is half to one net metering you know, they, seven and a half cents um when they'll sell it to you for 18. um but sorry julie you probably know more about this than me and i would love to hear the latest and greatest on ann arbor's uh sustainability sustainable energy utility so floor is yours yeah sure i'll i'll see what i can do and um john and the glra folks can certainly chime in too but uh, Steve, there's more to that DT rate case in regards to solar. It's pretty uh, devastating. They actually have these fees that are based on your highest use, your highest like three hours of use ever. And then they tack on these fees. It's going to be like, it would be hundreds of dollars of just fees just for the benefit of having solar on your roof per month. I mean, it would make, it would decimate the solar. No one would get solar. It was, it's just crazy is what it is. Um, so to answer your question directly about what the sustainability office has done is we were formal interveners in that rate case. So I spent, I don't know how much time writing, uh, <laughs> lengthy legalese sort of testimony along with Fang Wu who wrote even more and Missy Stoltz who wrote even more. And there were GLREA were interveners and all uh, there's been a ton of formal interveners and all of that is on public record. So you can actually go to the MPSC site and if you can't find it, I can find it for you at some point, but you can find and read all of what people have, uh, the testimony people have filed against this rate case. And so it's it's still out there um, and we're, I don't think anything's been settled yet. I think they're still, they're still open for comment or they're not anymore, but um, I can't predict the future. Uh, I would be, honestly, I would be shocked if anything like what they're proposing got accepted, but uh, you know, what do I know? Um, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say they are get it going egregious in order to get a compromise. Um, I think that that's politically what maybe what they're trying to do, but I, I don't even want the compromise. Like I, I just, I don't know what to say. It, you know, it is egregious. It's, it's bad. And it's bad from an equity, um, standpoint, just in terms of electricity rates going up yet again. Um, uh, you know, with folks who are already very energy burdened and can't do solar because of various reasons. So it's it's just bad all around. Um, so we're doing everything that we can to intervene in that is my answer to that. As far as where the sustainable energy utility is, for those of you who don't know, Ann Arbor has proposed a sustainable energy utility, which would be an SEU um, uh, it, a parallel utility to DTE. It would not be a full municipalization. We wouldn't be uh, taking uh, by condemnation all of DTE's infrastructure and then owning it and then paying for it. 
and then having to deal with it. <laughs> in, instead, uh, in my opinion, the grid of the future does not look like what DTE has. It looks like what Solar Steve is talking about, which is distributed generation and nano grids and micro grids. So um, the idea is we would build, we would become our own utility. Uh, the Michigan constitution gives us the right to do so. And um, we would build solar, SU owned solar all over everything, private property, you know, people would sign up for it. And then we would charge for the energy from that solar, but we couldn't feed back to the grid, right? So we'd have to have batteries and microgrids and load management so that we never fed back into the grid because DT would not allow it. So now you'd have a bill from the SEU for your distributed generation and you'd still have DTE power for backup. Uh, because it wouldn't build fast enough or robust enough to go completely to replace the whole grid, not for a while. Uh, where that is, is uh, we completed a very robust public comment period in, oh, sorry, SEU stands for Sustainable Energy Utility. Thank you, uh, Kate, I, for asking me to clarify that. I talk really fast. I think about this stuff all the time. So apologies for all the acronyms. And anyway, we did a very robust public outreach in Ann Arbor. Uh, we got something like 1,800 uh, responses to a survey. We did public meetings and talked to all of our commissions. And, and um, the overwhelming response was, do it. Um, there was single digits of people who said, don't, know, And another single digits, a number of people who said, I'm not sure, I don't understand, or I need more information, and <laughs> which... I mean, you don't get 80 some people percent of people agreeing about anything like ice cream or puppies. So I, we were shocked, quite frankly, about the degree of do this. And so um, we, we put together an analysis of the public outreach and brought it to city council. In the meantime, city council has also issued uh, or instructed staff to issue an RFP, which is a request for proposals for outside firms to analyze the the idea of an SEU amongst other things, other ways we could get um, you know, 100% renewable energy and full municipalization, that muni I talked about because there is a contingent of our population who desperately wants that. That RFP was issued, it is done. Uh, we've selected two firms to work together to complete it. And if you're up for fireworks, and you're kind of really nerdy like me, you could watch the city council, uh, which is coming up next to this coming Tuesday night after Labor Day. It's all public meeting on Zoom and they will be, we, our staff will be um, uh, giving them, you know, going over what, what the RFP uh, came, came with and the cost of it. And there will probably be public comment and there'll probably be lots of enthused people with all kinds of opinions sharing them. So the law, the short, the long answer, obviously, to your question is where it is, is there. Um, because then essentially, if that's what the city council wants us to do is get more information from an outside source, not just from the internal analysis that we've done as staff, then we will wait for that analysis that would give us a governance structure and a rate structure and determine if this is the best way for us to move forward to get our our, make our A20 goals happen, which I, of course, think it is, but I'm just like one person and, you know, lots of people have to make that decision. Does that answer your questions, Any? Will existing solar like ours be able to tap in? Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, you'll still be able to buy your own solar and you'll still be able to own your own solar. And the benefit of doing that is that it pays itself off, right? You'll own it. And then eventually you'll be paying very much lower bills uh, because it's paid off. Whereas an SEU owned solar, you don't pay for, but you're also not going to ever own it. So you're just paying a, a bill, which will be a reduced bill. It will be uh, our internal analysis suggests that it would be a, um, a uh, less expensive form of energy than DTE. So you'll, your rates will go down, but you'll never pay it off. It'll be ongoing. So there's still benefit too. And yes, current solar owners will be able to microgrid with neighbors once that process starts and share and then and, and uh, sign up for the SEU so that your excess generation gets paid for by the SEU instead of back to DTE. So hopefully at a better rate. Um, 
Yeah, it's very exciting. And Steve, I had a question that I don't want to forget. And I know we're getting close to time, but there's so much going on. Um, I did, you did do that analysis for me and I did switch to time of use. So thank you. But now I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. And I want to, I, I love your blog post. And I also want to help other Ann Arborites who could switch to time of use and thinking about their load management better once they get solar. There's so much to learn. And I, I'm afraid to front end all of my education for people. But once they have solar, I'd love to get them this information. But my confusion lies in, I'm now on time of use. Um, and before I was trying to always consume all the energy that at the time that I was using it, I was running everything and charging my car in the middle of the day and so forth. So now I think I should switch that to after 7 p.m. Um, I, I believe that that's true, but then I have all this energy. I feel like I'm not self-consuming. So I'm, 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 a, I'm a little confused about that. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I don't have a perfect answer because this is the absolute cutting edge of energy. I mean, time of use play rates, self-consumption, EV charging, things like that. So, um, I mean, for one, um, my co-founder and I as entrepreneurs were actually trying to develop some interface in your house that, you know, maybe it goes red to green or red to blue to green, just to give you some sense of like, how much excess solar do I have? So if it's really green or yellow to match the sun, then it, it's telling you like consume now you have excess solar. Um, so, but to di directly answer your question, um, your EV charging will depend on how big that load is. So if it's a, you know, I, if I plug my car in and it's a full level two, 240 volt, 50 amp, you know, I think that's, uh, let's call it 10 kW. You probably don't have enough solar to meet that. And your conclusion would be right that it's actually better to charge at night for that, uh, such a high load, because let's say you have two kilowatts of excess solar, you're plugging in a car, it's 10 kilowatts, you're going to be importing eight kilowatts on peak, which is expensive. Now, that being said, I mentioned the charge point home flex, um, which is the EVSE from, from DTE, $500 rebate. And there are others that have kind of a, a more smart load on them where um, they'll, they'll kind of do the math for you, if you will, and go, oh, Julie has three kilowatts of solar. Let's charge the car at three kilowatts. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's much smarter. Yeah. It's just shaving off, you know, the excess solar. Um, but yeah, as a rule of thumb, and this is what I told my parents, I would say winter, definitely just do it at night. It's, mm -hmm. it, you're not going to have that much solar in general. Um, and then spring, summer, fall or spring and fall, uh, you know, solar when it runs, when it's cooler, runs a little bit better. Um, if it's really sunny day, charge the EV and, and you'll be fine. Summer general rule, um, if the EV is your only big load and you have a big enough solar, uh, do it during the day um, if that's kind of your only main load. So I, I get this sounds confusing and it is your, you know, I, I said my cutting edge thing at the beginning of this. Um, I, I think it's going to get better with time and I, I'm glad folks like us are having these conversations to figure out just how do we explain this to people because I've been in the energy space for, since I studied it in school, I've been obsessed with it. And the number one thing I've noticed is just, we have the technology, the economics get better by the day. What it really comes down to is people understanding how they can adopt this stuff, how it fits into their life and how it makes their life better. Um, and we're getting there and it's really exciting. And you heard my grid optional pitch and how it's, more affordable, more reliable, and I own it. Like things like that get me really excited. But uh, we we still have a ways to go to get this mass market. But I'm glad folks like me and Julie and GLREA are talking about these things. And hopefully, I answered your question and I'm not sidestepping it too much. You did. Yes, you did. And thank you. And it's 802. So um, in the interest of respecting everybody's time. Um, and just to Dave, I was uh, about to email you back or answer your question in the chat. Um, 
you know, if we don't move forward with um, with an SEU for some reason, then you know the way that that people get uh, solar besides doing their own would be community solar, and we ha don't have legislation right now that enables true community solar. So that's another advocacy uh, that we need to do. We need to enable community solar in our state, not community solar that is owned by the utilities, but community solar that is owned by the community. Um, so more legislative advocacy there, uh, opportunities. Anyway, I'm gonna let everybody go. And Steve, that was fascinating, really. And I definitely wanna come out and see your hens and get some eggs and you can say lots of words and I will understand like 75, maybe, maybe 40%. I don't know. It depends on the words. So, uh, <laughs> but you're, you're, you're doing amazing work and I think you will get your one. Uh, what was it that you wanted to get? What was your goal of how much solar you want to facilitate? One I think terawatt. I, one I, terawatt. I'm not on Twitter and social media anymore. Um, but back in 2012, when I was studying energy systems engineering, I tweeted out, all I want to do is install a terawatt of solar. I'm about maybe 20 kW there, plus the 51 kW we have on Energio, which is a little side project. Julia was a trial customer for that. So we're getting there, but uh, I'm hoping it's like this soon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, John and GLREA and everybody for being here.